Continuing in deceptions concerning Yahweh's calendar of events. Now we left off here on page 32. Now I know we're getting into a lot of stuff, a lot of reading of uh, some complicated stuff and so forth, but uh, a lot of complicated reading, but I'm going to try and make it as simplified as I can with you tonight. So if you notice on page 32, the last thing we covered was about ancient astronomy and, and the Metonic cycle, which was the 19-year-old cycle where they, they figure out and have the whole um, calendar calculated. And this is what, of course, the Jews have done today. But So you see on the bottom of the page it says it was um, not yet wholly extinct, okay? It says that this... And, and notice also it comes from the Babylonians and, and the Greeks. But it says it was the Greeks who devised the Metonic cycle, which is still being used in the Christian churches to set their own holidays, as well as by the Jewish people of today who use the Babylonian Greek calculations to set their own feast. It's a definite fact that the Jews of today do not obey Yahweh's ordinances of his feast, as they did during the temple times to set the feast that Yeshua Messiah most assuredly kept. So the festivals of the Jews are not the feast of Yahweh today, okay? You know, and even if they did keep the correct times, unless they come to the chosen place, as Yahweh says in Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, then they're not keeping the feast. You know, you, you can't keep part of the law and then break part of the law. Uh, and if you remember what it says... Here in Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, let's look at the scriptures. Um, okay, it says, But you are to seek the habitation of your father, the house of Yahweh, the place which your father Yahweh has chosen out of all your tribes to establish his name, and there you must go. Okay, so you have to go to the place. Um, you have to go to Yahweh's place. There's no getting out of it. You have to keep all of Yahweh's laws or else you're not keeping the feast the way that Yahweh wants to keep. Because remember, the Sabbath days and the feast are set appointments. They're set times. They're established times. Yahweh established these days before he ever created the earth. Okay? And then he put into, into motion the laws that would allow these appointed times to come around at his time that he set and then we come to meet with him, okay? So, uh, as it says here, the Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 3, page 799, tells us that the Hebrew calendar was calculated in the Middle Ages. Now, the Middle Ages was the time between Imperial Rome and the beginning of the early uh, modern Europe, okay? And that was approximately 1100 to, to 1453 A.Y., uh, so this is referred to as Middle Ages. It's also referred to as the Dark Ages and stuff like that, you know, where they had no understanding at all. And remember, Yahweh's word was taken away from them during, throughout this time period. So they didn't have Yahweh's word to go by. Um, and it says here that the calendar was calculated in the Middle Ages and was based upon Ptolemy's Almagus, which is written in the year 200 of this Common Era. Now, in this article, it says, Astronomy in the Middle Ages. The principal co contributions of medieval Jewry to astronomy were the calculation of the Hebrew calendar. So notice what they did. They took the Hebrew calendar, which is the calendar Yahweh gave, and then they began to get into calculating it. Okay? Now, what I want you to realize uh, that throughout this whole time, as we read all of this, is a fact, the simple fact, is that... Yahweh tells man not to make himself into a god. Now, God is one who, who lifts himself up above Yahweh, right? To know more than Yahweh. Well, instead of taking Yahweh's commands, which are very simple, I mean, even a child can understand how to keep the, the, the calendar of Yahweh, man has to figure out why did the Creator do this? Or, or you know, and, and make, he took, just like he takes all of Yahweh's laws, and makes them much more complicated then the simplicity of that is there. And by doing that, of course, they lift themselves up and they make themselves into gods because they figure that they have to, and, that, and that's the bad thing about science, is that science, you know, science, Yahweh's way is, is, can be proven through science if it's used the proper way. 
But these scientists always lift themselves up, thinking that they know more and that they can expound everything and there is no creator, you know, all of these things just took place and so forth. Well, that's what they did with the calendar. And they got away from the simplicity that Yahweh has in it. So it says, the principal contributions of medieval Jewry to astronomy were the calculation of the Hebrew calendar, the translation of the Arabic works, and the diffusion of knowledge from the Arabic world, and the uh, compilation of astronomical tables for scientific and navigational purposes. So what they did is they took the Arabic works uh, and they had, they had compiled all these astronomical tables telling you the different things about the, the, the heavens. And also they would also use it for navigational purposes in order, you know, you can have the little instruments and look up at the stars and figure out the angles and all that kind of stuff and tell you exactly where you're at out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. So they had all these, these things figured out, okay? So they began to combine all these things. Now you see that next word. This is the Alexandrian astronomer of the second century. You don't pronounce the P, okay? It's Ptolemy. Ptolemy, the, the Alexandrian astronomer of the second century CE, compiled the Almagus, which is a long work in 13 books, system, uh, systematizing the structure of the universe, and Greek astronomy. The Almagus dominated astronomical and astrological thought for 14 centuries, that's 1400 years, becoming the authority on astronomy and the major source for astronomical commentaries and translations in the medieval period. So they figured they had the structure of the universe figured out and that all this had to do with, with the Greeks, the astronomers, uh, system of thought. Now the Jews were of major importance. You know, the thing is, it wasn't, it wasn't actually until the 1920s when astronomers themselves actually realized that there's a universe out there. <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't, hasn't gone on forever because when you look up at the sky and in the Milky Way, that's what they saw. You know, they, they saw all those, those stars out there and they thought that that was that was initially the part of the universe. It wasn't until they began to discover that they had galaxies and these galaxies were further out and not actually within our, our own Milky Way galaxy that they realized that there's an expanding universe out there. So it wasn't that long ago, you know, it wasn't that long ago, that only a hundred years ago that really that they figured this stuff out. The Jews were part of the major importance to scholastic uh, Europe and the beginning of the Renaissance, and that they provided a link between the Arabic translations, commentaries, and compilations of the Almagest and the Christian astronomers, okay? So they began to use this, and this was a, this work was considered a great work, okay? And like I said, it was used for like 1,400 years. Uh, there was no contesting it. You know, they, it was thought of as an accepted thing, and they stayed with it. And the Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 3, page 802, tells us of the early Jewish astronomers. It says, early Jewish astronomers, there were comparatively few original works by medieval Jewish astronomers, but of those, of those, a number were equal to the works of contemporary non-Jewish writers. Of importance was a group of men in the 8th and 9th centuries who took up astronomy professionally. Generally, they practiced as astrologers and their knowledge was derived from Greek and ancient Indian writers. Now, this was supposed to have been Jewish astronomers, okay? Which they should have been relying upon the scriptures and could have seen all the knowledge that was there. But instead, they relied upon the Greek and the ancient Indian writers and took their, their, their knowledge and also of astrology that they learned and applied all these things together. It says, comparatively few of their writings have been preserved. Some were translated into Latin, and a few works have been found in Hebrew. Uh, Mashallah, whose Hebrew name was possibly Yaob, or Yael, lived during the second half of the 8th and, ninth, and beginning of the 9th century and served in the courts of the caliphs in Baghdad. His essay, uh, and the, the last thing that's underlined there is the Tekufa Hashanim, has been preserved in Hebrew. The Persian Jewish astronomer, uh, Farak, who lived in the ninth century, is often identified with the expert in intercal 
with the expert in intercalculation, okay? And intercalculation is when they would actually insert days and months and so forth into the calendars to adjust it so that it would work properly according to their reckoning. Um, it says the Barata of Samuel, was, which dealt with the secrets of intercalculation, dates from the ninth century but was attributed to the Mara Samuel, uh, is regarded by some as the first original Hebrew work on astronomy in the Middle Ages. Okay, so this is why it held such a, a predominant role there. In Collis Encyclopedia, Volume Five, Page One Forty One, we talk about it talks about the Metonic cycle and uh, with seven set intercalculated moons within a period of 19 solar years. So let's read about this. The Metonic Cycle. The Metonic Cycle expresses the relation between a lunation and a tropical or solar year. Okay, lunation has to do, of course, to do with the lunar, the moon, the calendar itself. Uh, the moon cycle is the phases of the moon. And it has been the basis of the Greek, Jewish, and some other calendars. This cycle of 19 years, of, nine, of 12 months each, has seven months intercalculated. It is named after the Greek astronomer Maton, who discovered it independently about 432 B.C. Okay, this is like 430 years before Yeshua's time. Though it is held to have been known to the Chinese as far back as 2260 before Yeshua. Maton observed that a period of 19 solar years is composed of 235 lunations, or the cycles of the moon. He used exactly 365 and a quarter days for the year, and he had 19 Julian solar years equal to 6,939 days, 18 hours, and 232 lunations, okay, is what's equal to that, and 31 minutes, of course. And he had to intercalculate seven embolistic uh, months in this cycle. That means simply insert it, okay? He had to insert seven moons, or seven months into that cycle. Since 19 years of 12 lunar months, each totals about 228 months. Certain authorities hold that Matan's intercalculations were made in the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, and 19 years of the cycle. Now, one thing when you read that is like, there is no pattern there. Yahweh ever sets things as a pattern. But if you notice, it's like in the third and the sixth year. Okay, so you got the third and you got four and five. You got two years between that. The sixth and, and the eighth, you got one year. Uh, the eighth and the eleventh, you know, you got two there. You got, you know, and it goes on. And then you jump from the fourteenth to the nineteenth, almost five years. So it's like there's no set structure there. You know, it doesn't make any sense. It's just like he just threw these in wherever he felt like in order to bring up. But the problem is, you see, is they always... They're constantly trying to, to match up the lunar with the solar years, okay? And Yahweh never says anything about that. You know, he never says about that the lunar and solar has to match. He simply said in the very beginning what they were set there for, and we'll cover that in a little bit to make sense. So he found out that he had to set in seven of those. So in accordance with this scheme notice which it was, it was a scheme to pull the people's eyes because remember, the scientists and the astronomers and stuff, it, like, like you read in the book of Daniel about the astrologers and so forth, you know, they, they lifted themselves up. They were like the, the, the status of the priests and so forth, you know, they lifted themselves up to where they had higher regard with the kings and stuff, okay? These were the, these were the wise men, as they called them. So in accordance with this scheme, the years other than those just enumerated contain 12 lunar months, of 29 and 30 days, use alternately. So one was 29, one, one moon was 29, the next moon was 30. The next moon was 29, the next moon was 30. Okay. While the seven years mentioned had 13 months of the same length, with the embolistic month of 30 days for six of its years of 29 days for its seventh. And I don't expect you to even... Even... This doesn't make any sense anyway, right? But anyway, it says the first Metonic cycle was said to have begun in July of the year. I'm just reading it because I want to show you the confusion that there is in here, okay? 
Because you read and it's like, what in the world are they saying? The moon's phases recur in the same days within a few hours. Therefore, if new moon dates were recorded for a cycle, they became known for the next cycle. So it says the present Jewish calendar is exactly based upon the same metonic cycle used by the ancient Babylonians and the Greeks. And Pastor says the metonic cycle is a sun cycle of 19 years in which months were added in the years. 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, 17, and 19 of the same Babylonian cycle. So it's not Hebrew. This is not a Hebrew calendar. It's not, it has nothing to do with the Hebrew. It's the Babylonians, okay? Where well, they got this from? The Babylonians and the Greeks. Now, in the Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 5, page 43, it gives the exact information about this, how this pagan Babylonian calendar that the Jews use today is mentioned here. It says... Under the article calendar, it says um, the present Jewish calendar is lunar solar. The months being reckoned according to the moon and the years according to the sun. You get that? It's lunar solar. It's a mixture. That's not what Yahweh says to do. Okay. Let's look back here and see what Yahweh does say to do. And it's very, it's just so simple. It's man that makes things confusing, and man that makes things complicated, but it's not complicated. And what's complicated is to find the page I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Uh, can you see this? Exodus. Ah, Exodus 12. Let's look at uh, verse 2. Okay, so Yahweh said to Moshe, he says, Exodus 12, verse 2, this moon shall be the beginning of moon. It shall be the first moon of the year to you. Is that hard? Is that hard? And compl- is that complicated? This is the first moon, and it's the first moon. It begins the year. I mean, how much simpler can you get than something laid out like that? Okay? And so, if you know where that first moon is, then that's all you need. You don't need nothing else. You know when the year starts. You look for that moon, and then you go on from there. Very simple. You don't have to have all of these calculations and try and figure out the solar and the lunar and make them match together, because they don't, okay? The the lunar year is about 10, 11 days shorter than the quote-unquote solar year, okay? But that's not what Yahweh said to do, okay? Let's continue on here. It says in this article, it says a month is the period of time between one conjunction of the moon with the sun and the next. The conjunction of the moon with the sun is the point in time in which the moon is directly between the earth and the sun, but not on the same plan, plane, and thus it is invisible. Okay. Now, again, now in, w- coming with astronomy, okay, Yahweh says to look for the new moon, right? He tells you that. Everybody knows where that's at, right? Where's it at? Shout it out. Where is it? Come on, guys. Come on. Huh? Deuteronomy 16. Remember when he says, um, Deuteronomy 16. Yeah, let me get that. Deuteronomy 16. Can you see that? Deuteronomy 16. One. Watch for the new moon. Watch for the moon of green ears of barley. Okay? So he tells you, watch. Watch, watch. You observe. You physically observe. When you look up that word watch, it means to physically observe with the eyes. They look. You see it, okay? But you don't go out there. You, don't, you can't see nothing if the moon's dark, right? If it's dark, it, it, there's no moon out there. You can't see it. It's just a black sky. So you wait until that little sliver of light shows up so you can see it and you observe it. Now, astronomically, that's a one-day-old moon. Astronomically, a new moon is when it's dark. See? So you can see how Satan plays into all of these things. And she actually makes it, uh, makes the people believe that they're so intelligent, you know? But you got to remember something. King David didn't have a telescope, okay? He didn't go up on the hill and set up a telescope and, and, and look and to observe the moon, you know? All, all this kind of stuff came up many, many, many centuries later. And so the... New moon is the sighting of the moon, of the crescent. And that's the way the scripture describes it. Whereas astronomically, it means a dark moon, that there's no moon there. And that's what it's referring to here. 
the conjunction of the moon. That's why when you look on the calendar, you see when the conjunction is, and you have to have so many, so many hours after that because you really can't see. I mean, when the moon becomes 24 hours old, then you can see it's going to be a thin sliver, but you got to really look for it and stuff. But uh, anything, I mean, anything less than 18 hours, no one can, you can't see it with the human eye, really. And you'd have to be very high uh, uh, above and even having telescopes and so, I mean, um, um, binoculars and stuff to see anything younger than that. So it has to be a certain amount of time in order before it starts reflecting the light of the sun. Because the way that the moon is, I think it's like five degrees off a plane so that it can actually pick up the, the light source of the sun so we can see it. So anyway, he goes on here. The moon, the synodic months, the new nation is 29 days, 12 hours, 45 minutes, and three and one-third seconds. You get that? Write that down in your book so you know it, okay? That's going to be on the test. The synodic moon, a lunation is 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and three and a throw in third seconds. I'm sure King David wrote that down somewhere. It's got to be in Psalm somewhere, right? Oh, boy. All right, the Jewish system, the hour is divided into 1,080 parts, each of which is three and one third seconds. I knew I read that somewhere. The solar year is 365 days, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds which means that a solar year exceeds a lunar one, 12 months, by about 11 days. The cycles of 12 lunar months must therefore be adjusted to the solar year. Who says? Why would you have to do any adjustment? You see, this is man's magnification in his own mind to think that he's got to figure out what Yahweh has done and make it complicated. Because although the Jewish festivals are fixed according to the dates and months, they must also be in specific agricultural seasons of the year, which depend on the tropical solar year. Without any adjustment, the festivals would wander through the seasons, and the spring festival Passover, for example, would be celebrated eventually in winter and later in summer. No, it won't, you idiots! If you do what Yahweh says, it won't. What did he say do? He said, this is the beginning of the moon, right? Look for the moon of green ears. When you go out in the field and you see the green ears of barley, you look for the moon. You find the moon, that's the first moon. It ain't going to change. From year to year to year, it's not going to change. You're going to go out and you're going to look for the green ears. You're going to find the moon. How much simple can you get? If you do that, everything can fall right into place because it's because you're going exactly what Yahweh says to do. So it stays in sync. It's when they adjust these things. And they've got to remember now, when they went to Babylon and stuff, it changed your entire culture and so forth. And so then when they went to these calculating of these calendars, that was another means by which to keep them away from Yahweh. Okay, That was the whole purpose. So they figured that they had to go in and adjust everything and make everything work just right. The required adjustment is realized by the addition of the extra month, Ador the second. In each of the seven out of 19 years, which constitute the small lunar cycle of the moon. In 19 years, the solar cycle exceeds the lunar by about 209 days, which are approximately seven months. In temple times, this intercalation was decided upon in the individual years according to agricultural conditions. Of course, it had to be. Why did it have to be that way? It had to be that way because when Yeshua came, Yeshua, in order to be the Passover lamb, had to be put to death at the exact time that the Passover lambs were put to death. And so therefore, they had to be keeping the exact calendar that Yahweh set up in order for him to be the Messiah. Okay, He had to be Yahweh's Passover lamb. So yes, they were keeping it according to the agricultural conditions. And yes, you do, if you want to call that, insert another month, okay? We're coming up this year, okay? If we don't see the green ears after the 12th moon, what are we going to do? It becomes the 13th moon. And then you look for the next moon, and that's when it should be and will be the moon of, of, of Abib, okay? It's very simple. You don't have to worry about and count off all of these years and stuff. It's because they want to mix the solar, which is sun god worship, okay, along with the moon god worship is what they're doing. 
Okay, so it says here, however, it was fixed. Um, it was fixed to be in the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, and 19th, and 17th year of the cycle. Um, in the calendar month, only complete days were reckoned. In the full male months containing 30, and in the defective months, 29. Even in that sense, in the way that they say it, these are full and these are defective. You know, it's like, you know, it's Yahweh's way. You know, it's Yahweh's way. In fact, you know, when the moon, you, we look at the moon, you, you can't see it. But if you, if you take a snapshot of the moon every night, and at the end of the month, put those snapshots together and run them together, you'll see that the moon is not stationary. Okay, the, the moon will actually like pulse back and forth like this, and, and, and it moves a little bit. Okay, that's the way it moves when it, when it, when it's uh, orbiting around the Earth. And there is, and there's no such thing as the dark side of the moon. Okay, uh, the moon actually does revolve; it actually rotates. But the only thing is, is it rotates. It takes 24 hours to rotate, so therefore, it's always facing. Looks like it's facing the Earth. Okay, so there's three main calendars here in Collier's, volume 5, page 137, the types of calendars. There are three main types of calendars, the lunar, the solar, and the lunar solar. In the lunar calendar, it preserves the length of the lunar or sciatic months, synodic, whoops, sciatic, synodic, synodic months, 29 and a half days, and disregards the length of the solar year, notice. It disregards the length of the solar year, and that's really what Yahweh commands, because Yahweh's way is a lunar calendar. Okay? The Hamid calendar is a great example. It says most of the cultural groups using the lunar calendar reckon the months as having 29 and 30 days alternately, thus averaging 29 and a half days. In using the lunar calendar, the lunar year is taken, has been taken by 12 by 29 and a half for 254 days. A lunar year of 12 sonic months actually has 354.367056 days. You got that? Write that down, too. Okay. You're going to need to know that information. Okay. The, deci the decimal here is unaccounted for in the calendar and amounts to 11 days. Okay. 11.012 11 .11 days, to be exact. All right. So let's see. Now look at the. Uh, now it says the main difficulty is that in this year is about 11 days shorter than the solar year causing the seasons to occur at earlier and earlier dates throughout the years. Hence, it is impractical in civil affairs. B.S. Okay, and here's why. You don't set. Yahweh's feast days are set, but they're set according to the moon. And that's what they don't understand. The way that they're setting their days is according to the solar days. So, yes, if you, if, if, if you, if you say it's according to a solar day, then... Yes, it's going, to, it, it's going to get all confused because it'd be completely out of season. But if you do what Yahweh said, you look for the new moon and you count from there and you follow that pattern every year, it's going to be in the exact sink, in exact place where it's supposed to be. And it's not going to go out of season. It's going to be in exactly the same season because they're trying to mix lunar and solar and they don't mix. The solar calendar. It says the solar calendar holds to the length of the solar year as nearly as possible but it disregards the lunar month and assumes a set length of month, okay? Um, and the solar year is 365.2422 days long. Solar calendars include normal years of 365 days and allow for the fraction of 0 0.2422 days by intercalculating an extra day in each of the so-called leap years. The sol now, you see, that even shows you right there. Because the solar calendar is 365 and one quarter days, every four years you've got to have a leap day, right? You, gotta th you come up with an extra day and you've got to throw it in there. Where does it say in the scriptures anything about a leap day or a leap year, you know? It's not there because you don't have to worry about that. Don't worry about it. The solar calendar commonly has four crucial points. The two equinoxes and the two solstices, okay? The equinoxes when you have equal day and night. The time period is supposed to be equal, and they're not really exactly equal anyway, but that's what they're considered. And the solstices, okay? You have the, the winter solstice, the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year, and the winter solstice, which is the shortest. Now, the accuracy of such a calendar is established if, if the equinoxes always fall on or about the same days each year. So notice... 
There's a criteria there. If the equinoxes fall on or about the same days each year. The equinoxes, the, like the vernal equinox, okay, the summertime, springtime equinox, that's usually considered, you know, March 20th, okay, according to the Roman calendar. But actually it's not. It's actually three days before that, if you want to go astronomically, it's actually the 17th. So even these guys who are keeping this are all screwed up anyway because they're not even keeping the right days. Now here's the lunar solar, okay, the lunar solar. It says, in the lunar solar type of calendar, there is an attempt to keep the lengths of lunar month and the tropical year in harmony by periodic, periodic adjustments. So you see what they're doing. They're trying to mix the two together, okay, and it don't work. Uh, because they're always trying to adjust these days of the lunar year to match with the solar year, okay? And there's no need to. If you have Yahweh's time, there's no need to. You know, a day can only come about by using both the sun and the moon, okay? According to Yahweh's way. Let's look back at Genesis here real quick. Genesis a wardrobe adjustment here. Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, Yahweh tells in the very beginning here what to do and how simple it is. Okay, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, can you see that? Genesis chapter 1, verses, verse, can you read that? Okay, verse 14. And Yahweh said, let there be lights in the expanse of the firmament of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them, them, notice, the lights, let them serve as signs to mark the feast and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. And Yahweh made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser night to rule the night, okay, to govern the night, and he made the stars, okay? So he made both of these in order to be used. Now, you see here in Genesis, in, in chapter, Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, he says, And Yahweh called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 8. Okay, he called the expanse sky. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 13. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And then you got verse 19. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And 23, the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And then you talk about the sixth day. So... What did you read there? What pattern is there? The evening and the morning. That's what we just read, where Yahweh says he gave the two great lights, the sun to rule the day, the moon to, to rule the night, okay, to govern the night. So a day begins at sundown. The sun knows it's going down, okay? That's a law. It knows. When the sun goes down, a new day begins when evening time comes, when you're going to see the moon. That's the beginning of a day, okay? Psalm, let's see, Psalm 104. Uh, yeah. Oh, Psalm 104, verse 19 here. Notice it says, You appointed the moon for setting the feast. And the sun knows it's going down. So, yeah, what Yahweh made, the sun and the moon, they follow his laws. Okay? And there's no confusion there when Yahweh's laws are followed and Yahweh's laws are kept. It falls into perfect, perfect play. You know, it, everything falls right into line there. Let's get back here. It says, um, page 36, it says, the, gov the calendar that Yahweh gave to Moshe is strictly a lunar or moon calendar. The world's calendar is strictly a solar or sun calendar. The present Jewish calendar has mixed the lunar calendar with the solar calendar. Their calendar is a lunar, solar, or moon, sun calendar. The present Jewish calendar is not the way Yahweh, uh, not the way of Yahweh, 
even though the present Jewish calendar is an example of the lunar solar type. The Jews have rejected nearly every statue of Yahweh concerning his new moons and his appointed times in his sacred year and have replaced them with their own substitutions, which are based upon the Babylonian Greek astrology and astronomy. Yahweh's first moon is called Abib, green ears of barley. But they have substituted the Babylonian word Nisan for the scriptural word Abib. And that's what you see. They always refer to Nisan instead of Abib. So their new year is the first of Tishri, which they call, or they claim is on the Feast of Trumpets, which scripturally is Yahweh's seventh and scripturally last moon of his year. Now, they, what, they don't, what they don't realize is they're actually, they're ignorantly imitating the Babylonians by, you know, how, according to the solar year, you begin, you end your year and you begin your year in the middle of winter, right? At the end of the year. In, in that sense. And this is basically what they have done here with, by, by following this with Tishri, which is in the Feast of Trumpets, because that's not what Yahweh says to do. Okay? Yahweh is very plain in what he says to do and, and, and how, he, how he claims. When you look over to um, Leviticus, yeah. Leviticus 25, can you see that? In Leviticus 25, where are we at? Okay, it talks about <laughs> the seven years, okay? Seven-year cycle. And then he goes down and he says uh, in verse 9, Then you will have the trumpet of the jubilee. Now you count off your 49 years, okay? You have count off your seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of the year shall be to you 49 years. Then you have the trumpet of the jubilee sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh moon. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout the, yan- the land. And, of course, you consecrate the fiftieth year. That, my friends, is how you figure out what a civil year is. Okay? You remember what we just read here where it says the, the lunar cycle is impractical because... Oh, it's back here on page... Top of page 36. It says the lunar cycle... Uh, it's, in, it's impractical for civil affairs. No, it's not. It's perfect for civil affairs. Because if you do what Yahweh says to do, Day of Atonement to Day of Atonement is a civil year. It's exactly one year. Okay? It's a year. From one year to the next. From one feast to the next is your civil year. Okay? And that's how we keep, that's how we, we count the time for the seven-year cycle when we know when the third tithe year is supposed to be kept, when we know when the sabbatical year is to be kept, when we know how to count seven sabbatical years, and then you come to the Jubilee, which is the 50th year. Okay? So if you follow what Yahweh says, it's so plain and simple, but they make it so complicated in trying to figure out how to match or mix together and sync together the lunar and the solar. It's that mixture. And Yahweh says there is no mixture. It's simply lunar. So, it says here, um, they have set a day for their new moons based upon the astronomically calculated conjunctions of the moons. Yahweh tells his people to watch for his new moons. They do not watch for their new moons because at the conjunction of the moon, the moon is most definitely invisible. Okay, that's the darkness when there is no moon out there. The conjunction. The Jews make a show of keeping the feasts that are listed in Leviticus 23, but because an astrological, astrom- astrom- astronomical, pagan, Babylonian, Hellenistic, Greek influence, these feasts are their feasts and not the feast of Yahweh. You remember Isaiah 1 13 to 14 says, Don't bring any more vain abom- uh, obli- oblations. Your incense is abominable to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, your calling of assemblies, I cannot endure. Even the solemn meeting is iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me, says Yahweh. In fact, if somebody doesn't have that, we can look it up real quick. Probably should have done that for those who may not have the scriptures. So, 
here in the end verses. Ah. Verse 14, you'll notice he says, Your new moon, your appointed feast, my soul hates. Okay? Because they're man's. They're not Yahweh's, they're man's feast. And there's a big, 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 big difference. But they still won't understand. They think that they're doing what's right. Now notice Yahweh called these feasts that the Jews are now keeping today your new moons and your Sabbaths. Yahweh doesn't call, them, call these pagan feasts my feasts, but he does in, in, in the scriptures, right? And what he says in Leviticus? In Leviticus 23, Yahweh said to, to Moshe, Speak to the children of Israel and say to me concerning the feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. Okay? These are my feasts. So Yahweh tells you what is his feast, and he also says what's man's feast. So if anything is not done according to the way that Yahweh says to do it, it's not his, plain and simple. Now notice this. It says the present Jewish calendar is said to have been introduced by Hillel HaNashi II. Now, it's interesting because that word Hillel, <laughs> of course, it's Satan, okay? Ha, which is the, actually, and Nashi, the N-A-S-I, that, that, that was a prince of the Sanhedrin, okay? It was, an, it was an office that he held, okay, this guy. And this was in 358 to 359 of the Common Era. Uh, the calendar which is religiously observed and accepted by the Jews universally is a calendar which is based and set according to pagan sun worship. Pagan sun worship based upon the equinoxes and the solstices of the sun. The present Jewish calendar should have truthfully been called the ancient Babylonian calendar. One reason the present Jewish calendar has been so well accepted is because the Jewish astrologers, astronomers, have taken a scriptural Hebrew word which means feast circuit of Yahweh, and they teach the Hebrew word means equinox or solstice. And that is what we see had occurred to Solomon. Solomon accepted that, okay? Now, if you see here on page 38, the big lie, the vernal equinox. Of course, vernal refers to the springtime, okay? Equinox is supposed to be the time when day and night are equal. Now, many have tried to avoid obeying Yahweh based on their own religious festivals from the vernal equinox. Almost all Christian churches, whether Protestant, Catholic, or orthodox base their pagan Easter celebrations on the pagan vernal equinox, or the first day of spring, as they call it. The Catholic Church, Roman, uh, Roman and Orthodox, established this pagan practice in Christianity, and all of her daughters, the Protestants, who celebrate Easter, have accepted this custom. Now, Easter is found one time in the King James Version, and that's found in Acts 12, verse 4. It's only in the King James, okay? Because when you look at that word in the Greek, it's actually Passover. It's actually Pascha. But it's found in the, but they put Easter in the King James Version to throw people off. The Roman Catholic Church openly teaches this practice as part of their doctrine. Um, in the book, Could You Explain Catholic Practices, on page 67, it says, There are variable feasts which depend upon the changing date of Easter. The changing date of Easter. You know, because Easter is a movable feast. Easter can fall <laughs> on 35 different days. That's the time span that they have within there. Anywhere within 35 days, uh, it, can, it can fall. So within 35 years, it could be on a different day every year. But this is supposed to be their set feast, okay? But it's a movable feast. Ash Wednesday, that's when they smear the ashes on your head, you know? Ash Wednesday and the Feast of Ascension and Pentecost came later and early in the year with the variation of the date of Easter, which ranges from March 22nd to April 25th. It's easy to remember that Easter is always on the first Sunday, there's your God worship, Sunday God worship, following the first full moon after March 21st, the beginning of spring. The beginning of spring. Now, March 21st is supposed to be the vernal equinox. Now, why the first full moon? Remember, Psalm, they always try to imitate everything, right? 
Psalm 81, 81 verse 3. There we go. Blow the shofar, the ram's horn. Blow the shofar at the new moon. Blow the shofar at the time appointed in the full moon at the day of the solemn feast. Okay, now notice it says, this, for this was a statute to Israel and the law of the father of Yaakov. Okay, it's Yahweh's law. It was a statute given to Israel, but when they left it, worshiping Yahweh, they came up with their own calculations. Okay? And this is one of the things that they did. And there's a reason why it talks about the full moon, because if you remember, the full moon is when the feast starts, right? And, of course, they didn't want to have anything to do with the, the rabble of the Jews, and they did that on purpose. Now, um, he goes on and he says, uh, for the Easter, for the Easter date, a lunar almanac is used and opposite the EPAC, which that's a period that's added to harmonize the lunar with the solar calendar. Uh, Concern that new moon is located by which the full moon after the vernal equinox is found and the Sunday following is Easter. The first council of Nicaea in 325 set the date of Easter according to the Alexandrian computation. As Collars, volume 17, pages 520 says, it says the council um, promulgated, that simply means they make a belief known to as many people as possible by open declaration. You know, they, they declared, the council declared this is the way it is, and they made it public, in other words. So the council promulgated the famous Nicene Creed in its original form. It also decided that Easter should therefore be celebrated everywhere at the same time in accordance with the Alexandrian computation. So notice, Nicaea, <coughs> the Nicene Council was Nicaea, which is in Turkey, but they, they, was, they were separating at different times. They couldn't be in full agreement. So now they had the council and they said, this is when it's going to be, and they said it to be done. Now, it talks about the Alexandrian uh, computation. Now, it says the New International Dictionary of the Christian Church shows this. It says after, after A.D. 100, Easter, Pentecost, and Epiphany became the final parts of the church year. The time of the celebration in those early years is obscure. But during the second and third centuries, serious controversies arose, notice between some Catholic churches and the church in Rome concerning the proper time for the celebration of Christ's resurrection from the dead. But nowhere are we commanded, right? Nowhere are we commanded to to do that. But these controversies arose. Now, this Eastern group, known as the uh, Quoto Decimina, and what that means actually is it simply means... 14. <laughs> it means to the 14th, okay? They insisted that Easter be celebrated on the 14th of Nicene. Remember, Nicene is supposed to be Abib, correctly. Basically, the controversy was concerned with the question as to whether the Jewish Paschal Day, and it was Passover, or the Christian Sabbath, any day or Sunday, right, could determine the time for the celebration, and whether the day of the crucifixion or the day of the resurrection should be the focal point of the celebration. So the see, they were divided. Whether you should celebrate the crucifixion or whether you should celebrate the resurrection, they were all twisted in their, in their, in their minds thinking this way. But remember, Yahweh commands us to remember the day of his impalement. Okay? Because you remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that Yeshua is the Passover lamb of Yahweh. Okay? And so we celebrate his memorial Okay, having to do with this death. The resurrection, we don't, we don't celebrate that. Okay? We simply believe it and know that it's true that he, re- he was resurrected. That's the promise. He was the first one to be made into Yahweh's image and likeness. Now, it goes on and it says, uh, there's a prolonged struggle towards the close of the second century. It became so bitter that the bishop victor of Rome denounced the Quirodesimans as heretics. Call them heretics. The controversy was finally settled by the Council of Nicaea in 325. It was declared that Easter should be celebrated on the first Sunday after the the vernal full moon and never on the 14th day of Nicaea. So they separated themselves completely from Scripture. See, and what they did is they didn't want anyone thinking about the 14th, right? 
because that's when Yeshua would have been impaled. So they wanted to, to keep that out of the minds of the people. Okay? And so they, it was just another attempt to draw them further away from the scriptures and to put that separation in their minds. Um, I was going to... Oh, let's go over here. Okay, so in effect, the Council of Nicaea, the Catholic Church, denounced anything to do with the hostile rabble of the Jews and instead embraced the goddess of the dawn. When someone is obviously and blatantly wrong, it's very easy to avoid any doctrinal traps that anyone might try to set. The Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox were definitely in error about the celebration of Easter, and there would be no hesitation whatsoever on the part of those whom Yahweh is calling out to refuse to accept this teaching. However, what if a teaching was to originate from someone who claimed to come in the name of Yahweh? What if the teaching was to originate from someone who claimed to keep Yahweh's weekly Sabbath? What if the teaching was to originate from someone who claimed to keep all of Yahweh's feast days and brought you a new doctrine which had the sound of truth yet was so far from Yahweh's truth, you would definitely reject the lie, but what if you were deceived? Okay? And you would reject this type of lie only, only if you knew Yahweh's truth completely and did not allow yourself to fall into the same trap that Solomon allowed himself to fall into. And of course, this lie that is now being taught by some of the assemblies, and that they're using Yahweh's name to teach this lie, is a lie of always setting the new moon of green ears after the vernal equinox. And he says, beware of this lie. Reject this lie and turn to Yahweh with all your heart. Okay? Because the assemblies who teach this lie, of course, they set the religious festivals on the same pagan vernal equinox that the Christians use. And the assemblies do this, but they call this vernal equinox the Tekufa. They will not watch for a new moon of green ears until the vernal equinox, which they call the Tekufa, occurs. The assemblies who set their religious festivals, but definitely not Yahweh's feast, by the pagan vernal equinox, make these false statements. Now, this is, this is taken from the writings of these, some of these assemblies of Yahweh, okay? It says, The pagan harvest does not set the day for the first moon of Abib. That's a crock, because right there they're denying what Yahweh says in Exodus 12 too, right? Instead, it's the sun and the moon which determines the day and the moon and the year and the festivals. The sun returns to the same place each spring at the time of the equinox, which is the Hebrew Tekufa, on March 20th or 21st. And notice, March 20th or 21st? If it's so precise, if it's so precise, why isn't it just one day? Why, why is it going to be either March 20th or 21st? The new moon, which comes on or after the, the, this event, is the beginning of both the month and the year. The calendar of ancient Israel was reckoned in this way, not by the barley harvest. Right there, they're denying what the scriptures say, right? And I said, then to try and cover their tracks, they say, it's true that the barley in Israel was ripening at the time each year, but this is because the sun and the moon control the ripening process. No, it doesn't. Yahweh controls it. Yahweh is in full control. It's according to his laws. Uh, so that without fail, the barley will always be ripening in Israel in the month of Abib. If, now notice what they say, it will if we allow the first day of Abib to be determined by the equinox. That's not what the scriptures say. It doesn't say that at all. Yahweh doesn't command this. This if implies, of course, man's interpretation, right? Suppose that we have chosen a new moon, which is 14 days before the equinox, and observe the spring festivals by that reckoning. Passover falls exactly on the equinox. Come the fall festival, we're in trouble. I believe, he says. I believe for this reason. The Feast of Tabernacles will sometimes fall before the fall equinox, when really it must fall on or after the equinox. This is because the scripture in Exodus 34:22, which indicates the Feast of Tabernacles, is to be reckoned by the Tekufa, or the equinox, which is the beginning of a season. So it shows their ignorance that Rome declared long ago, right? In these ancient astronomies and so forth, astrologies and so forth, 
All these things are set up. So it, it really shows their ignorance when they say this. So it says, if someone wants to approach you with this information, could you rebuke the untruths? Or would you fall for these lies? Well, the preachers of these assemblies base their whole doctrine of the equinox, which is essentially identical to that of the Christian churches, on a single word in Hebrew, tekufa. When they talk to someone about the tekufa, they're talking to someone about the equinox. When they teach that, the Hebrew word tekufa means equinox, they are teaching an absolute scriptural lie. The scriptural meaning of the Hebrew word tekufa does not describe an equinox at all. Now we saw how Yahweh has days, months, and years, and so forth, right? Um, now, they talk about this, the, the, the vernal equinox. Remember, too, and this gets into astrology, it talks about the zodiac. Well, you remember what in Romans, Romans 1, uh, verse 21, it says, Because when they knew Yahweh, they did not glorify him as father, uh, neither were they thankful, because, and they became idolatrous. They became God worshippers. In their reasoning and their, and their senseless minds were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible father for images made to resemble corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, and the creeping things. This was the zodiac. Okay, this is what they did with the Zodiac. The Zodiac had all these different images in there. And you see that right here on the cover. Okay, if you see that. Oh. Here's the Zodiac. You see the different images of the beast and even of man. You see, this is the twins right here and stuff. Okay, so that's what they ended up doing. Yahweh gave them over to a reprobate mind, right? But notice what Yahweh says. It's, it's so very simple. Um, because as we saw in Genesis 1, 14 through 16... He gave the sun and the moon for, for light, right? And then you read where Yahweh says in Exodus, I mean in, in Isaiah 66, verse 23, he says, I've got to find the spot there. He says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come before me, says Yahweh. So notice, from one new moon to another. Does he say anything in there about an equinox? Does he say anything about looking for the sun or anything like that? No, he says from one new moon to another, okay? That's what Yahweh's law is based upon. It's based upon the, the lunar months, okay? From one new moon to another. It's very plain, very simple. Let me show you something, too, here. Now, we saw with the vernal equinox, it's supposed to be March 20th, right? And they show all, the, to all of this confusion that they have. Um, here, the, you see here the date, okay, 32019, that would be this year. So we have a new, we have a full moon there for the vernal equinox, right? Look in, here we have last year, it was only 10% moon. That wasn't a full moon. And then the year before, it was a half a moon. And then the year before that was 90-something percent, you know, so it goes on and then return back to, to, to nothing. You know, so it just shows that there's nothing standard in man's way in the way he figures these things out. If you just follow Yahweh's way, it's so simple that a child can figure it out. You look for the green ears, you find, you see the moon, you observe the moon in the sky, and you count off the days to the, throughout the year. Now remember, Yahweh's year begins not when the full moon of Abib, not, I mean, not at the new moon of Abib, but the first day of the Feast of Passover, of Unleavened Bread, okay? And then it ends on the last great day. That's the sacred year of Yahweh. However, from day of atonement to day of atonement is the silver year in which you count off for the years, okay? So this is how they figured out when the land would return back to someone else's ownership and so forth. I and mean, this is how they determined that slaves would be released and so forth. You know, it's very simple. It's very plainly laid out, but it has to do with the moon. And that's what Yahweh said in the very beginning in Genesis. He made the moon to rule the night. In the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. It's always the evening when you see the moon, nighttime, that begins the day, 
and then the daytime is when the sun is out. So this is how the sun and the moon is used to determine days and years and so forth. You can't get any simpler than that, right? It's very, very simple. But man, of course, wants to complicate things like he always does. And, of course, he got into all of these calculations and came up with all of this stuff. But you know what? They didn't have computers back then. <laughs> they didn't even have cell phones, man. You know, but they make you believe like as if they did because there's no possible way that you can get into all these calculations and all this stuff without, you know, just taking all of this time and, you know, it, it's a mixture. It's a total mixture. Well, look, we've got to stop here on page... Page 40, yeah, page 40. We'll stop on page 40 here and the, and the priest can take over next week. May Yahweh bless your week, men.